Hey everyone and welcome to the Boost Your Biology podcast. I'm your host Lucas and today I have a special guest joining me in also from Melbourne. Um, his name is Kyle Trainor. Um, and I met Kyle about uh, a few months back. Um, one of my close friends who's also a very influential um, health figure introduced me to Kyle and um, yeah, we sort of uh, hit it off and I was really curious by, um, you know, his background and what he had to offer. So I thought I'd bring him on to today's show just to talk all things like um, mindset, a little bit about business development um, and a little bit on psychology as well. So Kyle, thanks for joining me in today. I'm really excited to have you on. Thanks for having me, brother. I'm excited. Um... It's uh, we've yeah, as you said, we've known each other for a little while now. Like it's um, it it feels like quite a while. That anyway. So um, thanks for having me, man. It's an honor. Yeah. So I thought we might as well start out with um, you know, giving my audience a little bit of a background into your story um, and what you do. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I, I guess I'll start at the start. Um, I entered the health and fitness industry basically the same way everyone else did right we we um we have our own transformation we we kind of find um fitness and health at at one, a particular stage in our life and, and we fall in love with it you know we fall in love with what it's uh, allowed us to do um on a transformative level as individuals um and then like anyone who has a career in the industry now you want to give that to people you want to you want to give people the same experience the same transformative experience that um, you've had and, and you want to kind of liberate people and, and almost color their lens with, with what you can see. Um, and that quickly becomes your passion. Um, you know, my, I'll, I'll go right back to the start before I got into the industry. I, um, I played some pretty high level football, like, um, and so that's AFL over here in, in Australia. And, uh, I, at the age of 14, I had to have a knee reconstruction. So that's pretty early days for somebody, um, of that, or, you know, that's pretty young, uh, to have a, a major surgery like that, um, at that age, which, you know, it's a lot of time on the sidelines as well. So I was very passionate about my sport, which, you know, during that time I had no other, nothing else really to do except for, to get into the gym. And, and, you know, at the time you don't realize it, but, um, very quickly when I became lost as an 18 year old, um, you know, not knowing what I wanted to do when I was leaving school, I was never really great at school. Don't really, enjoy people telling me what to do <laughs> um, and, and making rules for me and telling me what I have to learn. So, so I never was really that great at school. And then I found myself lost at 18. And, and it's funny because, you know, the, the time spent up until then was just in love with sport and fitness. Right. So um, that was almost what I, f I fell into because I was like, okay, well, what's the one thing I actually enjoy? What's the one thing that feels effortless and, and that I think I could potentially do for the rest of my life. And, um, so I chose fitness and, and although my, my parents at the time weren't too happy with that, um, you know, and they, they weren't not happy with it, but, um, they, they, you know, they obviously wanted me to strive for what we know in these day and ages, um, you know, the, the high paying jobs, the, the jobs that have the perception of success that society paints on them. Um, you know, but again, as I said, nobody really could tell me what to do. Um, you know, that's just the way I've been my whole life. So I did it anyway. Right. And, um, I entered the uh, fitness space. I, I studied exercise science at university um, and then was also doing my cert three and four, which is basically my certification to become a personal trainer. Um, and just like school, <laughs> just like school, I, I didn't like being told what to learn. So uni lasted about a year. Um, and then I, I kind of left that and, and um, at, a, at a pretty young age of 19, went out and, and started my own um, personal training business, which I had while I was at uni, but then I decided to go all in on that. And, and that led me to obviously um, wanting, you know, my, my journey of self-actualization started to change a little bit. And all of a sudden there was this business element. So my goal was to run a successful business, to set my life up, to, to kind of really start taking action on things. Now, the first two years weren't like that. The first two years I was kind of all over the shop just really in love with training was pretty happy that I get to spend my days at the gym. Um, and then after that, you know, um, there was kind of one day where I was like, okay, well, I was a bit of a party boy back then as well. So, um, I, I, you know, I just decided to clean my act up and, and just take life seriously. Um, and that was probably at the age of 20, 
to 21. Like it was in between the, the, that, that, that year. Um, so, you know, I went, I went kind of as hard as I could at business. Um, and that was, you know, um, learning and, and kind of really honing in on my craft um, as a PT and, and what I wanted to kind of, the legacy I wanted to leave. And, and that's really what led me into the psychology side, right? Like I, I really did fall in love with human performance and psychology. And again, it was because um, I went through a bit of a transformation then I, I, you know, I'm playing it down a bit, but you know, my life changed dramatically then um, who I was as a person the things I started to achieve, um, I seen that really the, 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 the determining factor in that was my psychology. It was the story I tell myself. Um, so that's what led me to, to kind of honing in on that. You know, I don't get me wrong. I, I really, um, started to acquire the skill set um, in terms of science and, and, um, get good at that. And, and what I wanted to help people with is the psychological barriers that people face when trying to transform their body. Um, and I built a really good, a really kind of successful company around that where, you know, I started off just myself and then I built up to having, um, a team underneath me and, and kind of, uh, underneath the flagship of, of the brand, which is now Elite Vitality. And, um, what I started to see is that, you know, um, when people, so when I started to build my team, I started to, to recognize that these guys have the same problems that our clients are having. Right, there's such a, a, a roller coaster uh, that is human performance, that is um, execution of, of the things that we need to do in order to get the result that we need to have. Uh, and I started to see that um, this is something that uh, is a big problem in business. This is something that a lot of the, a problem that a lot of people face. So I, I quickly started to switch, and my passion, and this is where my passion started to fall into you know, really started to dive deep into, you know, psychology. But I also started to realize that this plays such a big role in business. Um, and that as a, as a small business owner, you were always a limiting factor. And, and that was something that I always told myself. And that's why I always prioritized it. I said, you know, if, if this is going to be successful, I need to be at my absolute best every single day. I need to make sure that, you know, um, I can, I can, um, I can take control of um, my actions and, and also, um, take back control when I lose control, right? That's, that's a big thing that I think a lot of people over, they overturn it or they, they kind of, they just jump over it. Um, so, you know, and then that led me to, to kind of starting a business and, and changing and pivoting to um, running a, a um, business consultancy company where we um, basically, you know, um, deliver education on the foundations uh, of what underpins a successful business. Uh, and then we offer a, a business coach or a consultant to help people apply it. And, and that's where we're at now um, as a company. And, and that's really what I do now is that, you know, my goal is to, to, um, to almost be the visionary leader of this company and, and make sure that we're growing our brand and, and creating a solid brand around that. And, um, you know, more strategy bird's eye view of the company at the moment where we're looking at how we grow this company and how do I manage my team um, to make sure that our brand um, has the, the most amount of output possible. Um, and as I said, you know, at the moment, um, a lot of what I do is, is, is in the trenches business, but um, deep down my, my love and passion still lies with psychology. I still think it's the most important factor and I still think it's the one that most people struggle with the most. Um, mm -hmm. So that's kind of like a, a, a backward story of, of where I, uh, from, from, you know, today to, to where I, I have came from. Yeah. That's really interesting, man. Um, there's a lot to unpack there, obviously. Uh, and you know, there's, there's some key points that I want to sort of, um, elaborate on. Um, and one in particular, you sort of mentioned, um, you know, some of the, the psychological barriers, um, that people face and that, that's not only applies to business, but also just to like the everyday life. So do you want to sort of um, unpack some of those um, barriers that, you know, we face on a daily basis? Yeah. I mean, one thing that I started to realize is that, um, and this comes from a lot of study in both in um, marketing uh, and also psychology is that story is as humans is our sense making device. So um, what actually happens, uh, from a like there's a there's a term called consciousness that i think um it's it's like almost the precursor to something that we call mindfulness and, and mindfulness is this buzzword now that everybody talks around it's like you know anybody who has an instagram and is in that space is you know preaching mindfulness but i think it gets lost in translation um and 
the reason is, is, and, and what you kind of realize is I, I started to, I read this book called building a story brand and it's, it's a book by Donald Miller and it's a marketing book. It's talking about building a brand, but what he talks about in that and, and something that I continuously hear from other experts in the psychology field is that story is our sense making device. So what we get caught up in, in our everyday life is we're always perceiving the outside world because that's where our, all of our threats are. Right. So we're always looking in the outside world. It's called our external consciousness for threats. Um, Cause obviously our main role in life is to survive and carry on the species that's evolutionary. So that's, that's built into us autonomously. Yeah. Um, so we're always perceiving the outside world. Right. And that's, that, that's unfortunately um, what causes a lot of our problems. Cause what actually happens is because within our mind story is our sense making device. We're always trying to build a story around the things that are happening in the outside world. Right now, the outside world that we have now obviously um, has, there's a, it's, 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 you know, as a society, we've progressed a lot. We've got a lot, our threats have gone from lions and bears and, and other tribes and, and, you know, um, from, from these kind of things to, you know, the person who's commenting on my Instagram feed to the, you know, to the, to the YouTuber, to the, to, to these things in, in our life right now, which, um, you know, you can see how all of a sudden and, and think about how many times these things actually hit you on a daily basis. These, you know, these little, um, dopaminergic, um, kind of hits, right? Like this is something that happens to us. We get marketed to nearly 90 million times a day or, or something like that. So it's like, it's understanding that what actually happens within our brain autonomously is that our, our brain naturally tries to perceive the outside world because that's where all of our threats are. But all of a sudden our threats have changed over time, right? Now, what we actually do in our head, and this is what our thoughts are. Our thoughts are our, is our brain creating a story about the outside world. So what you see, right, is if we're continuously um, getting, you know, think about Instagram, think about all these things. And I'm just using Instagram as, a, as an example because it, it really does tie in and, and it's social media really as a whole is that nobody really posts bad stuff on there. Like nobody gets on there and tells you all the bad things that happened in their day. Most people are telling you the good things that happened in their day. And think about the story that that then does. Like, it, you know, naturally we are trying to perceive threats. So it would be great if we could sit there and go, you know, good on, um, good on Charlene uh, for, you know, hitting her, you know, her PB this week. Good on uh, Roger for, for, you know, doing what he did this week. But instead what we do is because we're trying to perceive threats is we start to, we start to create a story as to, uh, and this is the self, right? This is what we call the self in psychology is like, you know, we, the, we, we, we begin to think that we are the center of the universe, right? We're trapped behind our own, our own eyes and that life is happening to us and it's not just happening, right? Like I often say something is like, does my life happen to you and does your life happen to me? Or do we just exist in this one world? And, and, but people don't see the world that way, right? So then guess what? The, they're trying to perceive threats. Their thoughts are the story that their brain creates in order to create and make sense of the external world. So then we start telling ourselves when we start to see things like social media and we keep getting bombarded with these things, we start to tell ourselves a story. And that story is why aren't I doing this? Why isn't this happening to me? Why is this? Why is that? And then we start to, that, that, that one little story that we tell ourselves actually fits into this grand picture of our whole life. And we often create a story about our whole life. Um, and it's funny, right? You ask everybody and they've got a hardship story. You know, I went through this when I was a kid. I went through that. And um, this, you can see how it actually ties in. And, and I actually think back and, and um, you know, there's, I was having a conversation with Ben Pakulski on my podcast, Deepak. And, um, you know, Ben's a, a really insightful character, but he said, you know, we, we had the moment afterwards. It was a really deep conversation and me and Ben got a good relationship. Um, and, and he was, he was my mentor for a long time. And, you know, he said to me, he goes, that, that shit doesn't actually happen. You know, like we, we often just tell ourselves this, right. And we build this story and, and, you know, could you imagine like there was a, a, a bullshit, uh, like a, a bullshit, um, filtration device built into humans that every time they bullshitted it we started to ding 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 right it's like could you imagine how many times that would go off and and i'm just like I, this is the thing right i'm not saying that i'm immune to this or anything like that I, you know we continuously do this as humans every single one of us 
we tell ourselves a story to either make us feel better or we keep telling ourselves a story of how our life is. Um, and, and then really that's the biggest problem I see, right? Is that, you know, we have to understand the importance of story without story. You think about it, it's in every one of our lives. Why do we love movies so much? Right? Why do we love books so much? All of these things, because they're telling us a story. It's what makes sense in our mind. Um, so then, you, you know, it's really important to understand that that is our sense-making device and that is that di- And, but the problem is, is that we've got an internal consciousness, right? We've, we've got an internal consciousness and you've probably heard the saying, our inner world creates our outer world, right? Like people say that if you don't fix your inner world, your outer world is never going to change. And although that is like this, one of those sayings and it's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Everybody says it. It's actually the truth, right? And the reason is, is because if the sense-making device, right, and this is kind of more talking about a a term called metacognition. Now, I look at metacognition, and this is something I learned off Craig Harper, who's um, he's he's another fitness dude that's real kind of psychological-based, one of the OGs, um, like being around for 40 years. But he kind of says that metacognition is story, right? So metacognition talks about like, Think about a brain on top of your brain watching what your brain does. That is story, right? Because that's us creating the story of the actions and everything that's going on without our life. Now, this is where mindfulness comes in, right? Mindfulness is your ability to remove the self in the present moment and stop listening to that story, right? Because if you're consistently telling yourself this story and it's a negative story, then that causes you, we know this, this top down mentality. We tell ourselves a story that creates a thought, right? That thought then becomes an emotion. That emotion then causes a physiological response. And that physiological response is what creates our outside world, right? So unless we have the ability to practice mindfulness, right? And, and be in the present moment and actually break and, and stop. What's the right word to, to, to sort of the pattern to cut in and stop yeah. telling ourselves that story then we literally lack the abilities to change the things in our outside world and it's this negative feedback loop where that physiological response then comes comes back and it causes you to tell yourself a story about that action that story fits into this grand story that we're telling ourselves and then it's the same thing thought emotion physiological response and it just keeps happening over and over again and Joe Dispenza, right? Who's an absolute, he's the OG of meditation. Um, um, and, and especially bringing the science to the, to the, to the forefront, but he kind of talks about, you know, most people wake up, they look at their phone and they go through this same, this same kind of uh, routine every day. And, and it's that, that that's what mind, if you lack mindfulness, you go through that every single day and it becomes routine. It becomes repetitive and then that is where you just, you know, you can't actually change your life. And you know, he actually talks about it. He goes, you know, um, by the age of 35, a lot of our life is on repeat. You know, like it's from that goes on. Now, that doesn't mean that you can't change your life after that. But it just means that, you know, for especially for me, you know, and, and us, we're very young, right? So for all the people that are young out there, you know, this, this talks to the fact that you should be really looking after yourself right now and really setting good habits and, focusing on um reaching your potential and for those that aren't um that doesn't mean that you can't it just means that you, you've got to try extra hard you've got to put in the work you've got to you've got to be tenacious right tenacity is another thing that comes into this you know as a you know from a scientific term it actually you know if we actually look at what it means it means to be the ability to hold on right now if you lack tenacity is the same thing if you can re- repeat that and create that um, hardwired circuit within your brain and, and, you know, what we call cortical thickening, right? Cortical thickening is, and is, is, you know, uh, when we refire that pattern, um, and that connection gets a lot stronger. Um, that's what we want to create. Cause when tenacity becomes one of those, those, um, we, you know, it becomes one of those hardwired circuits, we have the ability to hold on in tough circumstances. Right. So, you know, what we're looking at here is understanding that what, there's stuff that happens autonomously in our body based on the stories we tell ourselves, which cause physiological responses. Now I'm a massive fan of meditation for this reason, because meditation is the practice of almost just being in the present moment. Right? So, you know, this is why the breathing is important. It's this, this signal to bring you back to the present moment. 
from being lost in thought. Um, and you can see that thoughts don't actually, you don't have a choice in what you think. It's, it's, it just happens, right? And that's why we, can all, we, we find ourselves lost in thought because we're actually trying to make sense of the world. Right, so you can see now. The more time we spend in the present moment, the closer we get to the truth. And the truth is, is that the world isn't about us. So we need to stop telling ourselves that. And that's when we can start to really, um, what I believe is, start to reach our potential and, and unlock, you know, this higher level of human performance. In such is that when we start, and and again, I like to use meditation. It's not the only way, but it, it is practice. The practice of mindfulness. It is the practice of breaking that story, bringing myself back to the present moment. And if I actually get better and hardwire that as a skill, then I, I give myself the ability to change my trajectory at any point in time in my life, whether it's a good time or a bad time, because the, again, it's not about being always being strong or always being amazing. It's about finding neutrality in everything we do, because that's where we are the most rational. And if we continuously make rational decisions, we, we, we get closer to the truth. And, and that's where we can start to unlock human performance. Yeah. I think um, one thing about, you know, encouraging people to practice like meditation and mindfulness and things like that. What do you think is like, um, why do you think it's so difficult for some people to actually commence such a, a very simple task? Like, why is it so difficult for some people? Well, I mean, there's a lack of awareness, right? Like it's easy for me to say this, but you know, the reason I love it so much is because I understand it. Now, most people, when you talk about meditation and it is getting better, you know, but you know, we're, we're pretty lucky to have someone named Sam Harris right now who's pioneering some, some pretty amazing stuff and getting this, you know, in the, in the, the known world. But it, it, it really is, is because people don't truly understand it. And, and that's one thing that I say is that anybody who asks me about, it, I get a lot of messages about it on Instagram and these kind of things. Um, and, and I just, I send people like I've got four podcasts, right. That I, that uh, four podcast episodes that I send to people. Um, two of them are Sam from Sam Harris's podcast. One is a Joe Dispenza. Um, and the other is, I, I can't remember who it is. It's a bit of a random one, but the thing that we understand there, right. And the thing that becomes important is that I, you need to understand it. Otherwise you're not going to have the tenacity or you're not going to have the ability to sit through it because think about it, right. In, unless you, most people don't, we've got to look at mindfulness as a skill, right? Mindfulness is the ability to break that. Now, what people don't understand about meditation is it's not about not thinking or sitting there and being, it being perfect. It's about finding neutrality, as I said, in that moment, within that time period and continuously just bringing yourself back to the present moment. It's the practice of that. Right. Right? Think about it. if I sit down for 10 minutes every day and just listen to my mind, Will I understand it? Will I start to understand it, right? It's like, you know, nobody understands something from reading one book in one day. You have to, you have to continuously study a subject. And it's like, okay, well, if the goal of meditation is to understand my mind because I want to unlock human performance, then I have to sit with it no matter how painful it is, right? Now, the problem is, is that think about what we said before. If that story is so negative about ourselves, right. then and I'm sitting down, if, if my thoughts on my sense-making device and the story I tell myself about the world and I perceive the world in a negative way, then those thoughts, whether, you know, they may not be negative, but majority of them may be, right? And then it's hard for people to sit with those thoughts, right? Because they're actually listening to them. They're, they're indulged and they're, they're, you know, they're like watching a movie of their own life of how bad it is, right? Think about it. It's like, the, you know, you're, you're sitting there just eating popcorn, indulging believing right it's like you're that person at the cinema who goes is this a true story like whoa right and you're sitting there and eating the popcorn and just letting this thing roll on and it continuously happens and then guess what people like everything else in the world and, and what social media does to us right it makes us want things quickly it makes us want things right now it, and and that's not what meditation is about Med meditation is about experiencing the present moment for what it is in a thought-free state of neither knowingness uh, sorry, of knowingness in a thought-free state of knowingness with neither need or want. So the need to, for things to be amazing in that moment, the need for things to be perfect actually defeats the purpose of what we're trying to do when we sit down and meditate. But people don't understand that. So then what happens is they sit down, you know, and they, they find themselves just being lost in thought all the time. And then they're like, oh, well, I'm not doing it right. And then they say, ah, oh, meditation is not for me, right? 
you know, and, and that's why it's so hard because to sit there and listen to thoughts about negativity all the time, uh, you know, it's easy for me to go on my phone and scroll and be dead, right? To be, to, to be just be absolutely nothing for the next two hours. It's easy for me to sit down on the couch and watch Netflix yeah. because guess what? That means that my brain's occupied and I don't have to tell myself the negative story anymore. Sure. It's easy for me to, to, um, to listen to music. Um, and, and this is, you know, I, I truly think silence is the most beautiful thing in the world. And I think once you find peace in silence, you become an absolute monster, right? And, and I mean that in a, in a positive way, because when you can find peace in silence, um, you, you know, there's a quote, when, when you find peace in silence, you either become a wild beast or a god. Um, and that's, a, that's a, a stoic quote, but it really does talk about that, you know, most people need to fill their lives with things. And that's why so many people are busy and unhappy. And they're not actually fulfilling what they want in life is because they're just filling their life. They're just, you know, again, it's easy to fill time. People love being busy because the more busier I am, the less I actually have to look at myself and analyze and live an examined life. Yeah. I find, um, I find that really challenging, like in today's society, man, like, I mean, I'm also running a business as well. And so like, it's, it's hard because we get so stuck in the momentum of progression, growth development, but never really taking time to, have a break and just like sit with ourself and be like, right, am I, am I really aligning with my values? And like, am I doing the things that are, that I've always wanted to do? And um, yeah, just going back to that and like having the chance and space, which I find is difficult myself. I don't know if you find it also tough because you're always progressing, always wanting to develop. It's a never ending battle, man. That's why I, you know, I often talk about, I don't, I don't like talking about meditation in this light, but I, I, I often tell myself it's about paying rent. Every, you know, I, I, I don't want to achieve goals that have, you know, for me, it's about the person I am. It's about who I want to become as a person. And if my goals are changing that for me, or if I'm sacrificing who I am as a person to achieve some type of status, status is a zero sum game, man. It's nobody, nobody wins right? Like the society doesn't get better the more people that chase status. Look at what social media does to us as, as a society. It's ruining us, right? And the reason it's ruining us is because people just play the status game. Everybody's worried about being famous and not worried about what it's costing them to get there. And, and, and the internal consequence of, of playing that game. And, um, you know, that's, that's the battle we pay. And, and again, that's why I say it's paying rent. Every day I meditate because if I don't, I'm telling myself I don't care about the person I'm becoming. And the other thing I will say about this is that you don't have to surrender your happiness to future times. You don't have to surrender your happiness to these goals. You, you know, again, the only, this is another Sam Harris thing. And, and I'm, I must say is he's, he's influenced my, my knowledge and, and, you know, uh, everything about me on, on such a large scale, but all you ever have is the present moment, man. Like, you know, the future never arrives. Um, and the past is a memory. So, you only ever have the present moment and the more time we spend in the past or the future, the less time we actually get to find beauty in what is the present moment. And that's where true fulfillment, joy and happiness actually occurs. You know, memories and and some of our fondest memories are actually when we are at our most present, right? When, when we are sitting in front of our partner and, you know, you can think back to the, the little times where, you know, you just felt like you were floating and, you know, for me, it's, you know, uh, grand finals, right? For, for me, I love to go to the football, right? Because the football is me in the present moment. That is really one of those times when I go and watch a, an AFL game when I am completely present because I love it so much. It is, is the time that I never think about the bad things going on in my life. I never think about anything like that. And, and that's a little lesson, right? These are our fondest memories and they're experienced in the present moment. So, the more time we spend in the present moment, the more fulfillment we find in life. Um, and if you actually look at a lot of the things that cause us the most suffering, it is the, you know, the, our, us trying to predict the future um, and think, and then that's what causes us to, to suffer. Or it is, it is literally, um, you know, uh, memories in the past that of things that weren't great and trauma that, you know, stick with us for long periods of time that cause us suffering. So, you know, again, it's, it's about paying rent every day on the person you want to be and, and never wavering and never compromising on that. Yeah. You mentioned um, a little bit about chasing status. Um, and I want to sort of unpack that a little bit because personally I had a chat with a friend literally about this exact topic the other day and it was related to like, and I'm falling victim to that 
100% chasing status. But if I really look back at why I'm doing that, it's because with status comes power, with power comes influence and with influence comes like a sense of value. So for me, chasing status equals power, which then gives me influence, which I want to do, you know, I want to spread my message and which is literally my Instagram and my website. And because I've now got that status, I have the power to, you know, really, I have a voice. I have a voice. I want to be, I'm, I'm heard. And so that's really, I think, I, I, it makes me wonder whether many great leaders chase that status for that same reason. You know? well, well, the reason is like the first thing I want to say is, you, you know, the, the, the end part you said the right there is the, the key is great leaders, right? So, so what makes a great leader? And if we actually unpack that, you'll start to, you get, you get a better answer, right? Because great leaders don't chase status. They understand status. They understand it's a, plays a role in, in their, legacy um in the world but you know there's a big difference between nelson mandela and and gandhi and um, a lot of these uh you know people that go down in history um as great leaders winston churchill theodore roosevelt and then you think about some of the not so great leaders in the world and some of the ones that we can paint you know um trump he's not a great leader like you know i mean i don't know too much about what he does behind the scenes and and for the economy and these kind of things like i I do a little bit but we're not going to go into that but you know, he, as an actual leader, he's just not great, right? He's not good. He's not a great leader. And you think about like the footprint that now is now going to be left um, in the world. Let's, what are people going to say in 20 years time? And, and that's really what we're looking at is that great leaders don't chase status, right? Grace, great leaders chase influence and they leave their footprint and make the world a better place. So, but there's a big difference. And, and I think social media makes people want to chase status. Like I know plenty of people that chase status that, um, that aren't leaving their footprint in the world or, you know, most people think that it's going to help them in business. And I can tell you that it's, it's, it really doesn't like, unless there's, there's a lot to unpack there, but I will say that status is a zero sum game. People that chase status and make status the goal um, don't make the world a better place. The world doesn't get better from them uh, achieving it. And the thing with status as well, that we've got to start to think about is the only way I can actually improve my status is by someone else, someone else not. Status is a game where one person always ends up higher than the other. And that is, it's very hard not to compromise uh, ethically on that. Right? Think about it. The more power you get, the, the greater amount of um, pressure there is to maintain your status, which means that can, can, can you handle that in the present moment? Can you actually make a decision that's aligned with you ethically if it may cost you um, that status, maybe someone's attacking you, maybe someone's threatening to take your spot in the industry, or maybe your spot on the, on that hierar- hierarchical ladder. Um, and that's where most people go wrong. And that's why status is a zero sum game, because what it ends up in is everybody's trying to, you know, um, kill each other get, to get to the top. Um, and that doesn't make society a better place because of what it creates is um, this you know, um, esoteric untruthfulness to the world, right? Like think about it. There's a lot of people out there that are living a lie or, or are kind of, you know, they're, they're just, they're doing whatever it takes to get to the top. And, and, you know, as I said, it's a zero sum game. It leaves a lot of people empty inside um, and it leaves um, the world in a worse place. So it doesn't mean that um, status isn't a great tool. It just means how you use it is, is probably the most important thing in my opinion. Yeah. And, One thing to add to that is um, the interconnectedness between status and ego. So do you want to sort of unpack a little bit about ego and how that can influence, um, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, like, as I said, I'm going to preempt this, right? Like I, I, I'm not, uh, I don't have any qualifications in psychology, right? I'm, I'm just a lover of it. I think I'm, this is all, um, me talking about the stuff that I've read, stuff that I've studied and, 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 you know, heavily, you know, there was a, a time where I would study four or five hours a day on this stuff for a very long time. Um, but the other side of it is, is that I've, this is me talking out of experience. You know, I'm, I, I, I love this stuff and I, I do. And, and, uh, this is none of this is stuff that I haven't tried on myself and I haven't done any of that. And I think the thing with the ego, right, is the ego becomes your resistance to growth. Like it's, it's this, it, it really is 
like a shadow, right. That follows you around. And, and it's this thing that you can never really get rid of. You can, again, you can only control it. And, and again, this is mindfulness in action, right? Mindfulness is a bit, my ability to drop my ego. Like, you know, when I'm sitting in front of someone and maybe they're wrong, how do I go about it? Do I, do I try to play the status card and know that I could pretty much embarrass them and it would make me look great or, you know, it would make me, my status of, of who I am in the hierarchical ladder go up or do I go behind the scenes and say, look, that, I don't know if I agree with that, um, you know, and, and this is the, the evidence, but like, I'm only doing this because I think it's going to benefit you. And again, like the ego is there as resistance to growth. It, it's purely there as something to stop you from growing because it's, how do I explain this? It's, it sits there. And, and again, I'm talking growth as a person right? It, it literally is something that will sit there and it will stop you from growing because the body doesn't like to, it likes to stay the same. Like it's, you know, that's what we're wired to do, right? Which, and, and that's in built into us on many levels, right? So it's, you know, it's understanding that um, the, the reason that the ego is so aligned with status is because, um, we again, and, and this can come back to the story that we tell ourselves. Like a, a lot of the time it can come back to this where it's like the story we tell ourselves, right. Uh, dictates our actions in every moment. And a lot of the time that that story can be the ego, right. Protecting us. It is a survival mechanism, mm. the ego. That's what it's there for. And that's why in some instances, it's actually great to have an ego. Yeah. It's great for that ego to come out um, and to be in full flight because it will protect you. Um, but a lot of the time, um, it's not needed. And a lot of the time it, it, again, it can come at the cost of others. Um, and it can be, it is, it, and that's why honestly, like, that's what it is. It is a survival mechanism. The, the ego is there to protect you, but a lot of the time we don't need protecting, you know, we don't, we don't, we live in a pretty good world. We live in a world full of abundance. And what we see is now that the ego is programmed, um, and we have, there's many different factors that affect it. And, and it has, there's a lot more that it has to filter. Um, and a lot of the time, what I think is it just gets it wrong. It gets it, you know, it's, it comes out when it doesn't need to be there. And, and again, if we uh, have the inability to practice mindfulness, then we have the inability to, to control the ego. And that's, that's where it ties in with status because we think that status comes with success. And a lot of people just try to achieve status for the fact that they want to be famous for the fact that it makes them feel good. Right. But the problem is, is that when it comes at the cost of others, eventually it leaves us feeling empty inside. Yeah. In my opinion. <laughs> well, I mean, no matter how hard you try to grow, you're always going to leave. Um, it's always going to come at the expense of others though. Like that's part of the, that's part of the growth. That's part of like, it's just sacrifice, right? Like, and that's another thing that you've spoken about a lot in the past is sacrifice. Um, and, you know, how, how do we, how do we consider something too far? We're sacrificing things way too far. Um, oh, that's a, that's a really tough question. I, I want to go back. I don't think you always, like, I honestly don't think you, that growth always comes at the cost of someone else. Like, I, I really don't. Like, I think as more time goes by, I think a lot of the time, sometimes it status wise, it does like, you know, if you it's for status gains, but if we, we got to really unpack what growth is like growth, isn't money growth, isn't status. Like growth, isn't any of these things. Like you can have a lot of money and still be uh, growth is fulfillment. Growth is self-actualization, right? Growth is me reaching my potential. Um, and what that potential is, is dynamic and different to everyone. So I think dependent upon what that goal is, that's what depends. That's what self like that, the whatever self actualization is to the individual is, is how that's created, if that makes sense. So it's like, you know, my goal isn't to, if I want to be the richest man in the world, then yeah, it might have to come at the cost of others, but that's not my measuring stick. My measuring stick for me is the person I am. It's, it's how I treat my family. It's how I treat, you know, what's the, what do people say to me? Um, what do people say about me at my funeral? Um, and that's a question that I got asked by um, one of my mentors and, and it was really powerful, but it's like, what, what, do, you know, what do people say about you at your funeral? What are the stories that everybody says and, and tells? And 
um, that's, that, that is the measuring stick for me. It's like, you know, how I treat people and, and what people say about me really, really means something to me. Um, and it's because, you know, the measuring stick for me is that it's how I treat people. It's the legacy I leave. It's, it's what, you know, um, and that's, that's my own self-actualization. That's why I feel unease, right? I feel, um, unease when I feel that my want for status and money outruns my need to be a great person to, to leave a legacy, to leave the world in a better place because that's, and again, this is, this is what we, we understand, right? Is that we, when we know that we're not living aligned, that is when the ego will actually come and protect us, right? That's when we start, you know, cause again, the only, like, this is what, like a lot of the time when we're not living aligned to who we want to be, right. And, and the, the story, you know, and the, the story we tell ourselves about who we want to be, then we bottle up this emotion, right? And this can come from trauma. This can come from anything. This, this is literally, we are wired this way, right? But we bottle up emotion, right? And then we bottle up emotion so much that the only way I can release the gasket, the only way I can release the pressure valve is by pushing this out to the world, right? And that's, why the, that's where the ego exists, right? Because when somebody, when I feel threatened, that's when the ego comes in. It starts to protect me and it protects me and, you know, a lot of the time it protects me by putting others down by feeling the need to, to hurt somebody, um, both either physically or emotionally, um, to protect myself. Right. Because that's, that's how, that's how it's been done for years. Right. Like that's, that's, that's the, that's the evolution of what, what we do. Right. So I think understanding that and understanding that, the, and again, this is, again, spending more time with yourself and understanding yourself is the absolute key here is that because you learn to deal with things, you know, you no longer do these emotions bottle up inside and then we just have to blurt it out to the world. And, and, you know, we all know somebody that continuously complains, right? And every time you come to them, they tell you every single problem they're having in life, yeah. right? I think that is what we're talking about there. That's, an, um, that's someone who has the inability to deal with these emotions that are internal. They're happening in their internal consciousness. So the only way that they can get this release of pressure internally is to actually project it out to the world. And then again, that's how our inner world starts to create our outer world. Unless I'm dealing with things internally, then I, I really have no choice in how I live my life. And the th same things will keep on happening to me over and over and over again. Um, so yeah, that, I mean, I hope that answered your question. I think I got a little bit lost up there, but yeah, I mean, it definitely like that, that last point that you said about, um, you know, people that complain, um, the reason why they do that may just well be because they just want to be, they want to feel heard. They want to feel understood and that's them trying to make sense of their world. Um, as well. Like that could be, that could be their, or they're trying to rationalize their world right like that's the other thing that's that's the other thing that happens it's the ego trying to protect us right so because because again in order for me to deal with my internal world and actually start to change my external world that means i have to take responsibility for everything that happens to me right now most people give their power out to to the to the outside world and when you when you give that you become powerless you you lack the ability to change anything so the hardest thing for somebody to do is to admit that they're wrong i guarantee you the hardest thing for anybody to do in life is to admit that they're wrong because the ego protects you from that. So right? the ego is, is the thing that actually protects you from that. So then it makes me wonder whether, you know, some of the, the best leaders in the world, do you think that they've like, have they admitted that they're wrong? Like along the way? Are, are they? I think you're asking the wrong question. I think you're, you, you got to go a step further and say, what's the story they're telling themselves? Because somebody can have a massive ego, but then the story they're telling themselves is what actually gets them through and allows them to become, again, th this is where the, the thing of great leader comes in. Like we're talking, there's great leaders out there that are horrible people, right? Or what might people say, oh, what, are, what is a great leader? Like to me, a great leader is someone who's compassionate. It's someone who's empathetic. It's someone who um, is selfless. It's somebody who um, is, is tenacious. It's somebody who, you know, really um, tries to make the world a better place no matter what, it's someone who's um, bold, brave, right? But, you know, then we can look at some people that are in really high places of power that aren't those things. And again, the story I tell myself is what might the great leader is to me, but what a great leader is to somebody else is different. So it's important to understand that 
Um, like it's important to understand that, you know, again, we all, we all have dynamic situations. I'm wired a certain way because of the experiences I've been through. So are you. So that means what you perceive as a great leader and what I perceive as a great leader is totally different. Yeah. You know what I mean? And, and that's, that's really important um, to understand because we talk about in great, we're talking about great leaders and we're not, we're not actually, uh, paying attention to the fact that that's different for everybody. And again, I think the thing you're saying is, is like how do some of these people end up in these positions, right? Like how to, you know, cause again, it's that, you know, cause there are people out there that have massive egos. And honestly, a lot of the most powerful people in the world have that ego because they rationalize everything they do. And that's the story they tell themselves. So therefore, do you think that they like, along their way they would have been wrong many many times so it makes me wonder whether they've just brushed it aside and been like no i'm 100%. wrong i've been right 100 never been because in- it's easier for them to 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 rationalize the situation and the ego come in and protect them and then they build a story about that and then that's what gives them the energy that's this their, their physiological response is still you know it's still very much moving in the direction they want it to because they just keep rationalizing and telling themselves the same story. Now, I think true liberation is when that you can admit that you're wrong and that you can actually deal with consequences internally, mm. right? That's for me what is the most liberating feeling in the world. Now, again, the goal is probably different for me to them. Like my goal is to become a great human. Um, their goal is probably to have a lot of money, right? Now, is one right or wrong? It's probably not my place to say, man. Like I'm not going to come out and say, yeah, like fuck money and, and all of this kind of stuff. Like it's it's not... Like again, I, I'm I've spent enough work a time understanding that my opinion isn't just the one and the only one that matters, and it's definitely not right or wrong. It's just mine. Um, and and again, what we got to understand is try it, try it. Like you know, if we look at tribes, you know, there's going to be people that listen to this and say, I really love what that guy has to say. There's going to be people that go, Yeah, probably wasn't in my in my hood. It probably wasn't something that I I really kind of connect with that's totally fine. And that's the, that's the game the whole world's playing. Some people love Arnold Schwarzenegger. Some people love Jeff Bezos, Jeff Bezos. Some people love um, Michael Jordan, right? Now the people that like them are wired a certain way based on their experiences. And they look up to these people because the story they tell themselves, right? You see how powerful this is. Um, and then that's how we create um, followings and these kind of things. Like, you know, is somebody, Put it this way: Do you reckon somebody from acting school is going to come into you know your podcast and really enjoy it? No chance. <laughs> no chance. You're not going to be their tribal leader, right? Yeah. So, so it's understanding that you know this is a really dynamic kind of situation. And and um, look, in my opinion, and and from my point of view, the ability to in deal with your internal problems is again the most powerful tool in the world because it again it takes you closer to the truth. And when you get closer to the truth, your decision making and judgment gets better. So the problem is, is that we also see is with a lot of these tribal leaders, right? Um, they know how to play the game, right? Like, you know, the, what, what, they might, they, what's the game? they might be dealing, they might be dealing with these internal problems, but then, you know, they just playing the game with obviously creating a facade that allows them to keep living the life they want. And that's, look, there's nothing wrong with that either. Like I don't, we're never going to know right? Truly. We might find out in a few cases, but we're never going to know. So again, I, I still think whether, you know, there's going to be a lot of people out there that, and a lot of these leaders and, and a lot of people there, but I really think that the most liberating thing you can do is learn how to deal with things internally and take responsibility for everything. Um, because that's when you, that's the only time that you can ever start to change anything. It's a shame that we're not taught this in school. Like, you know, back in high school, you know, a lot of guys that I went to school with, like, if I if I brought this up with them now, mate, they wouldn't. They don't want to know about it at all. That you even well, bring up the fact that you, you need to work through things and like stop bottling up emotions. Why it's so difficult for it's it's very difficult for a lot of guys. Hundred percent, it is right. It's the most. It's the hardest thing in the world. You know, like because again, you have to admit that you're wrong. You have to. You know, that, that's hard to do. Like it's really hard to sit there and go, you are not a good person. You know, you are you are not who you want to be you are not this you are not that it's it's very hard for you to do that because it's autonomous a lot of this stuff is autonomous it's and and 
we don't understand that it's happening. And then for me to go back on this and actually say to myself, well, you are wrong. You are, this is not who you want to be. This is not the person you want to be. It's extremely hard to do because it, 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 like it, it can make you feel anxious. It can make you feel all these things. And, um, but it is only then that you can actually start to change your trajectory is when you take responsibility for it. Yeah. And when you, when you're being like very self-critical, um, it, it, it's very hard. Like I look back at the person I was when I was 19 and I'm just like, like, you know, you were an absolute asshole. Like, and I look back at, you know, uh, I often see people from my school, right. And I was, I was almost like a jock. Like I was like a guy, which, you know, you, you know a lot of people look now and they're like, I can't believe you were like that. Like, cause I'm, I'm a very different person, but you know, um, I was, I was, I was not a great person back then. Like I was, I was mean to a lot of people like I was, during high school and these kind of things. But the only reason I was like that is because of the things that I had been through in my life. So it's not about blaming myself. It's not about turning around and pointing the finger. It's about saying, I, I don't want to do that anymore. And I want to start to change things. And I've got to take responsibility for the fact that the reason I was like that isn't anybody else's fault. It's, it's mine. It's, 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 it's my responsibility. My life is my responsibility. Right. And, and the only way I can start to change things and truly start to change things is by taking responsibility and, and dealing with the internal and doing the internal work. Yeah. It's um, extreme ownership, man. Like that's, that's what it's about. Um, and it's, it's difficult. It is very difficult. Um, but, but hats off to you, man, for making like, for, ch- for pivoting back then. Cause it would have been very difficult, like very, very difficult to, you know, come out of that. Oh, it, was, it was, it was extremely hard. Like I, you know, I can still kind of pinpoint a few conversations with, you know, I was lucky to have some pretty um, amazing people in my life and, and probably owe a lot to them. Definitely owe a lot to them, but you know, it's, it's difficult for anyone to do this, but it's, again, it's, it, it is the, the uh, igniter in a sense of change, right? It, it is what allows you to start making change only when you are willing to take responsibility for everything and, and quickly right? The, the world doesn't belong to the, the biggest, the world belongs to the fastest. You, the more, the quicker you can, can, ad, you can adapt to change. That is literally what survival of the fittest is. But this is as a person as well, the quicker you can get a grasp on things internally, the quicker things start to change in externally. Uh, and, and that's really the, the message is that the better you get it um, honing in and, and developing these skills that allow you to work, do the internal work, the quicker your life starts to starts to change externally, and that's when you gain momentum and and start to to grow. But it is really something where you got to pay rent every day. You know, it's something that you you have to wake up and and want to be a better person, want to do the internal work every single day. Otherwise, um, you know, you you're just letting go, right? And you 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 you're, you start to see that you're allowing and you're giving power back to the world, and and instead of having it within you, and and that's when you obviously can stagnate and go backwards. It's really powerful, man. Thanks. Thanks for sharing that. And, you know, um, and respect, respect to you for even sharing that. Um, Cause that's obviously for a lot of, a lot of people that that can be very difficult. So um, <clears throat> yeah, sort of. Well, it's, wanna... it's a part of it, right? Like, you know, you got to share this stuff. You got to be open. You know, I, I took responsibility for it and I still do. And, and it's, it's actually something that helps me now. You know, the, the fact that I know what I don't want to be um, is a big, big kind of help to me understanding who I want to be. Um, and, and that's, again, it's, it's about being open. It's about admitting um, that I'm wrong and I'm not always right. And admitting that sometimes I do things wrong and I still sometimes do things wrong. I still sometimes don't um, live in alignment and, and it's about recognizing that. And, and again, it, I, I want to draw this back because it's a really important point, but I want to draw this back to meditation. The win in meditation is it not being lost in thought. The win in meditation is recognizing that you're lost in thought. The win in life is not being a, a bad person or not living aligned to your values. The win in life is recognizing when you are, right? It's recognizing when, hey, maybe I'm not doing what I want to do. Maybe I'm not living aligned. Maybe I'm not, you know, working towards that vision. Maybe I'm not giving myself the best opportunity. That's the win. It's the rec- it's, it's the ability to recognize because when I recognize, I take responsibility and that's when I can change it. So I'm open about when I'm wrong. When I have a fight with my partner, it finishes in a second, right? Because I go, okay, I'm wrong. 
right? When I sit there in front of someone and, you know, in our, when, it, when I'm consulting with a company and, you know, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I, maybe I, I, was, I was wrong on that. Maybe it wasn't the best move. Maybe, you know, um, it was something like that. You know, I'm open about it because it gives me the power. As long as I'm open about it and I take responsibility for it, I still hold the power. And that means nobody can take that from me, right? And, and that is the key here is that, you know, again, you, you start to give your power to the outside world when you, you lack the ability to take responsibility. I love it, man. It's, um, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's powerful. It's really powerful. Um, so we're getting, getting close to the end. Um, there's a few other, is there any, any other sort of topics you want to like expand on? Any other things that you've learned in particular maybe recently things that you've learned in the last couple of months or so? Oh man. Um, oh, there's a heat, right? Like I think, um, I mean, probably more in the business space. Like I, I've learned to heap over the last, that's where my focus has been the last, I would say four to six months, obviously with COVID and, and um, you know, what it's, what it's, it's, it's wreaking havoc um, at the moment. So a lot of what we do, but I, I think, you know, this stuff becomes just more important right now more than ever. Um, you're spending more time at home. You're spending more time with your loved ones. We're obviously, the, you know, things aren't going to as planned. The story we're telling ourselves, you know, plays a big role in, in our actions. And now more than ever, it's, it's really important that a lot of people start to, to place emphasis and pay attention to this stuff because you, you know, what you do now is almost going to have tenfold or the impact uh, in the world um, because everything is so the world's level of consciousness in a sense, like I don't want to, like that might lose a few people, but you know, the world's energy is, is taking a beating at the moment. It's, it's yeah, it's taking a beating. So, you know, your ability to take responsibility for your own actions um, and admit that you're, you know, admit when you're not living aligned and, and, and be a great person is going to affect. And, and so, you know, how you act right now affects people tenfold, right? So if you're with your family and you're an asshole, uh, you know, that's going to affect them and that's going to have a, a larger effect than what it previously did. And it's the same with the other way. If you, if you position yourself as somebody who cares and somebody who's willing to help and listen and be empathetic and, and you place yourself that that's going to, that's going to, you know, have a dramatic impact on, um, those pe on, on the people you care about and the people that you're around as well. And, um, you know, that is understanding that that changes people's lives. You know, this stuff, we don't place emphasis on it, but our actions every day play a pivotal role in someone else's journey. And, you know, the stuff that I say on here, the stuff that I say to my partner, the stuff that I say to my clients, every little thing that I do, every little word that I say makes an impact and it wires someone. The brain is plastic, which means that people take things in. You could be mean to someone. It could be the slightest little thing, but it could have such a big effect. And especially right now. Um, and we're seeing, you know, the stats are going to come out eventually on, on, on a lot of topics, you know, in the world, but, you know, dare I say that, um, there's been no more important times than right now to be a great person and to, 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 um, to be empathetic, to be compassionate. Um, that it's just extremely important right now that everybody does their best and everybody takes responsibility when they're not at their best. Um, because that's what makes the world a better place. If status makes it worse then then internal work makes it better. And, and that's what we should be focusing on. Awesome, man. Awesome. Do the inner work, everyone. <laughs> Do the inner work. Do the inner work. Because that's where, you know, that's where it all starts. And then from that, we can influence the outer world, which is what you just literally demonstrated. So, um, yeah, well, thanks for, um, thanks for joining me in today, Kyle. It's been a, it's been a really deep chat and I always knew it was going to be that. Um, Cause it's, it's not, it's, it's no other way with, with Kyle. Uh, <laughs> literally we've had a few yeah so um <clears throat> if my listeners want to learn more about you um your content your business as well um where can they where can they find out more about you 
Yeah, I got a personal Instagram page that I'm making a little bit more effort now with. Um, uh, it's Kyle R. Trainer, and our company's uh, uh, Instagram as well is Elite Vitality Mastery. So um, you can go and check out those. Um, everything's on there. We've got a podcast as well, very business focused, um, and, and a little bit of psychology as well. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, as I said, we're, we're getting a little bit more busy on there. So we're trying to put out a lot more content and, um, the other thing as well, I'm, I'm very open. If, if somebody wants to chat, if anybody wants to shoot me a message and, or has any questions, then they can feel free to do so. Because, um, as I said, I'm a bit of an open book when it comes to all this stuff. Beautiful. Um, so for those listening in, I'll be linking everything Kyle just mentioned, um, in the show notes. Um, but that pretty much wraps up today. So yeah, thanks for coming on board, Kyle. And um, I look forward to the next episode. Thanks for having me, man. Thank you, everyone, for joining in to today's episode. For in-depth show notes and lessons learned, visit nofilter.media forward slash boost your biology. This has been a No Filter Media production. Say what you want.